Okay, that takes us to the end of Run DMC, and now mm. we go in a completely different direction. The the which you got to wonder the thought process when that band name was being mm -hmm. picked, and yeah, maybe we'll get some context there. But Matt, why don't you give us the context of the numbers? So yeah, so the the's album Soul Mining comes in at number one fifty two in the nineteen eighties on Best Ever Albums, number fifteen in nineteen eighty three. Number 1,011 of all time. It is The The's highest rated album on Best Ever Albums. And The The comes in at number 463 of overall artist rankings on Best Ever Albums. Uh, again, not making Rolling Stones list. So I think I go first here. And yeah, I, I really yep. didn't Can know Can I add about... one piece of context real real quick, Matt, uh -huh. if you don't mind? Because I looked this up to try to find out the origin of The The. And yeah. I found this gem that you'll find funny. A gentleman by the name of Matt Johnson from the band placed an advertisement in NME. So they're another one of these bands that was formed by random classified ad type deal. And it says, bass lead guitarist into the Velvet Underground and Sid Barrett. He didn't get too many bites, so he placed a second advertisement in NME that stated his influences as The Residence and Throbbing Gristle. <laughs> so, oh, jeez. There you go, Matt. All, All of right. whom we've covered. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, um... I like this much better than the residents and throb and uh, throbbing gristle, so I will say that off the bat. So, uh, yeah, this is. I'm just actually looking at the the track listing on best on uh, Wikipedia, and it's another one of those different listings that what I listen to on uh, Spotify. Uh oh, I, so um, I didn't check. Yeah, so I'm not sure what the true album is. All these <laughs> British artists always just messing stuff up. Uh, speaking of British, this is a pretty British album, and um, I it's it's got an interesting mix. I thought it was going to be more of a a straight up kind of dance record, and mm -hmm. I mean it certainly has those elements, but it's it there are other parts of this that um, like the Twilight Hour. It's kind of more of a mood, um, atmospheric kind of sound that they're that they're going for. Uh, there are definitely some synths there. I, I was picking up on some new wavy things that were happening. There's uh, some marimbas um, and that are happening. That's happening, but also kind of like a like a almost like a piano and guitar breakdown, uh, you know, as well. So there's a lot of different things that they're drawing uh, from on this. And overall, I think it, I think it works pretty well. I think it's 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 interesting. It's catchy. There's um, there's good variety here. There's ups. There's downs. Uh, there's some long tracks on here, particularly the uh, it's at least on my track listing here, the penultimate track, Giant, which is nine over nine and a half minutes long. Yeah, I listen um, I to could, the same version, Matt, just for reference, the Spotify version. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think uh, I could see where some people might feel that that needs to stop or just not be that long. I actually kind of liked the groove that they were going with there. I didn't, I didn't mind that at all. And um, you know, the more I listened to it, the more I was like, I'm, I'm okay with this, you know. Um, and I don't, I guess that could be, I don't know. I was kind of, I was kind of wondering, like, is this supposed to be? A song like that's supposed to be a full-blown dance song or is it just like an electronic song you know i think sometimes i just just because the song's like electronic doesn't necessarily mean it's supposed to be for the dance floor or the club yeah. or whatever now that it could be used for that i you can definitely dance to it but but i don't know i mean i think that there's definitely other types of songs that would be bigger you know hits in a dance club or more prone to more 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 adept at you know kind of you know filling that uh, that filling out that vibe in a dance club so um so yeah i thought that this was this was interesting um i thought it was it was going to be more straightforward than what it was so um i think i give it a little couple of bonus points for for mixing it up a bit and um liked some of the guitar tones it's it's definitely got some uh, the 80s guitar tone but it's uh yeah it was enjoyable i i, I was um I, I didn't i wasn't like amazed by it but it was definitely kind of interesting and i am going to go with a thumbs up on this record yeah, this was a pleasant surprise for me. I really enjoyed this album. Um, it's it's a very hard album to categorize. And I think um, mm -hmm. the first time I listen, it, it's also an album that, by the way, um, gets better when you listen to it each time, at least in my yeah. opinion, it did. Um, the first time I was kind of processing it because uh, my first listen is always to kind of get a feel for an album. And then the second is where I go back with a purpose. And then if I listen a third time, it's when... I can't get the essence of what we talk about in these cold listens. And so this was a three listener for me because the first time I was like, Ooh, I can't, 
I couldn't really summarize what I heard. And the second time I went back, I made a big point because I knew I was going to listen to it a third time to write down all of the instruments that I heard um, because there were a ton. And then I kind of, I had 15 that I identified, but I found out later when I looked at the personnel that there's actually 18 unique instruments on here. Um, but I, I had sort of sketched besides the obvious, the guitars and the drums and Matt mentioned the marimbas, but there's piano, there's a fiddle on a song, there's brass instruments. I think it's a, a trumpets on there, a cello, is there an accor accordion? Accordion. Is there an accordion, yes. yep, mm -hmm. a violin, harmonica is there. So I had all these different things down and then I found out in looking at it that I was like, wow, there's some stuff that even slipped in without me catching it. There's the melodica. I don't know if I can truly do that. There, There's a credit for sticks. Like, I guess that's just banging sticks Come on, together. John. You don't know a melodica when you hear one. <laughs> and I didn't, for whatever reason, catch the flute um, on Three yeah. Orange Kisses from Kazan. But uh, that was there, too. So, yeah, there's a bunch. But I, I what I liked about that, to me, this is what a post-punk album is. Because this is, to me, post-punk is sort of, we joke that it's something and everything at the same time. Uh, and that's what this was. It's, you know, just when you think it's going to be like a synthy atmospheric album it then gets upbeat and it comes like a dance uh dance pop album and then it kind of goes into the new romantic even a little bit at times there's new age um and because of that i thought there was a vitality to the album that i really enjoyed um i would say that if i was gonna you mean new, make it do you mean new wave or new you knew you thought just uh, new age oh new new wave excuse me new okay wave, i'm oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. new, new age yeah totally different yeah no no new age <laughs> sorry yeah no new age. no yanni sound on this new wave <laughs> thank you for correcting me matt i can only imagine the comments i would have gotten there but um but uh because of that um it felt of its time but in a good way right yeah and we say some albums transcend and some don't this if you'd said to me when do you think this album was made john i would have said i don't know like 1983 or 1984 so and sure enough um it was recorded in 82 83 and released in late 83 uh but i, I really like this and um i i love a versatile album that you can play at different times of the day you could do it you could listen to it while you're in the car but you can also play it when you're winding down at night and it works in both formats. To me, that's what a really good versatile album is. Um, and that's how I felt about this album. Some Another thing that was really interesting is I, I always pick the two songs for the, the playlist. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have Spotify up in front of me with the total plays and stuff. And as I picked it, I picked This Is The Day and Uncertain Smile because I'm like, yeah, these are just yes. really strong. Yeah. Um, pop sensibility songs. And sure enough, I, I pulled it up as we're talking here and there. By far the two most uh, played songs. So uh, they stood out. But there wasn't, I didn't feel there was a bad track uh, on this entire album. And like you, Matt, I didn't find the nearly 10 minute giant or the nearly seven minute uncertain smile to be too long. And I think that's because they evoked a mood. And mm -hmm. I, when I'm going to get a long track i want to kind of immerse my if i'm going to be there i'm going to be there for a while so i need to kind of have the landscape if that makes sense and so i do best with long tracks that almost serve as a a setting that i go into because i'm gonna if i'm gonna be spending time there i'm gonna have to immerse because you kind of have to immerse in a 10 minute song and so i need to know what i'm getting into and and that i think matt is why prog rock can be tough for me sometimes because mm. There's, there's just so much going on, and I know that's really appealing for folks, but like I need to be able to move in and set up a chair <laughs> and, and stay a while. <laughs> and I think sometimes Prog Rock's like, yeah, we don't really want you to stay too long, and that's okay, but I, I don't know if I want to spend 10 minutes there. Um, and, so, and I think that's why I did better with the long jazz tracks, because they invited that um, mm -hmm. same mood. But yeah, I, this one was a thumbs up for me. I agree, Matt. I, I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Yeah, I, I'm with you guys. I really, I really like this album. I think it might be my pick of the week. I'm not sure. There's, it's up there for sure. This is, um, this is like synth pop at its best. I feel like, um, maybe the next kind of, uh, generation of synth pop or the next evolution of synth pop in my mind from what we've listened to so far. Like you guys said, I think this the foundation of the synth in synth pop is used in harmony with all these other instruments to provide this depth um, to to the sound and to um, 
the variety of of tracks on this album there is kind of something for everyone on here like you said you've got the the more straightforward pop um uh songs that would definitely like feel like would fit on the radio today or on some playlist and pop them on there with uh, more contemporary artists there's some more uh almost like dance dance focused tracks on here and then there's some more laid back stuff um that's more contemplative and i feel like all of it works really well um i think there's a lot of uh talent on here with all the different uh musicians playing the instruments and and uh the including apparently jules holland is on a track of later with jules holland fame so, yeah um yeah. The piano on yeah. the piano on uncertain smile is really good. That is that's solid. I feel like his the Matt is it Matt Johnson? He's the lead. He is is he? He's the main guy. The the the, the piano <laughs> you like on uncertain smile is your boy Jules Holland playing oh, the piano yeah. on it. So there you go. Yep. Um, yeah, Matt Johnson's listed as the only consistent. There's a ton of former members, including correct, Johnny Marr, yeah. I guess, yeah. who was on this oh. in this after the Smiths. But Matt Johnson's the only one that's been there from the yeah. get go. I, re- I really like his voice. You can tell it's kind of like, you can tell he's British, but it it works really well in the uh, in what he's trying to convey in the songs. The, um, what else? I really like the accordion on "This Is the Day." That was really effective. They they just the the songs are just really well crafted, and I feel like they they kind of wash over you and and like you said john listening to this more the more i liked it um uh, it there is definitely something here i feel like this is an influential album even though i have no no uh evidence to back that up but i feel like a lot of artists today have taken what they've done on this album uh, you know taken influences from this album and done on it and uh, i just feel like it's one of the just it's just a really solid album and i feel like it's going to be really high in my in my rankings of the of the 80s albums um as a result and also always pleasant when i haven't even heard of a band before and and kind of immediately uh take to them like we have with so many other bands that we've listened to yeah can i throw in the lyrics i i think are pretty good but there's a lot of analogies and symbolism um mm-hmm. that so there's a lot of imagery um, so the stories are about people, but they're also about general emotions, if that makes sense. And there's a lot of, you know, comparing things to being like glue or the sun or, you know, stuff like that. So almost a poetic flash mm-hmm. to the lyrics. Uh, and also, uh, along with the uh, variety of instruments, I'd like to shout out, and this won't be the last time I say this this week uh, for albums, but uh, the bass parts on this album, I really liked a mm. lot. Um, the bass lines at different times. I, I think of um, uh, Uncertain Smile in particular when the guitar solo's going and there's a bass line behind it that, that is a really appealing merging of those two elements. And there aren't a lot of songs that stand out to me as having both the piano and the bass because you know the piano can play the role of the bass or or drums or guitar depending mm-hmm. on how you use it in songs but um in this case they were weaving and doing different things like the piano was almost the guitar solo right and the bass was behind it so it sort of served as a as a two the same uh general sonic approach as like two guitars but with the piano playing the role of the lead guitar so i really enjoyed that uh, mm. as well so David Johansson played harmonica on this too. Hmm. Really? Looks okay. Like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Buster Poindexter himself. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. That's. Yeah. I mean, it was no shortage of uh, of players who just came and did their yeah. part and then you know, moved on. So I had and I had heard of them before. I just I I was always you know one of those bands that I was familiar with the name but not anything that they did. So, um, but yeah, it was it was definitely enjoyable. I don't. So, John, you mentioned that that song Three Orange Kisses" from Kazan. I don't. There's not. That's not a track that's on the album I listened to. So I don't. And that's not listed in any right. of the Spotify. And that's track what I'm saying. Listings. It's not on the one I listened so, to either. So, so you wouldn't like have heard flute at all. That, okay, so I'm not going crazy because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it said it was on Three Orange Kisses" from Kazan and "Waiting for the Upturn." Right. Neither and of. I don't neither know of which are on the yeah, <laughs> yeah are on the the the, the we so listened to the are, vinyl. Yeah, those are listed as the UK and Europe cassette. Okay, 
that those songs. So I'm not going crazy. That I didn't that. hear a flute. Okay, because I'm like, <laughs> I, I feel like the flute's a very distinct sound. Oh, there. And not okay. like in the Jethro Tull way, but like in the I always notice it. Yeah, and... this is this is one of those things where you look at the track listing, and there's like five different track listings depending on what you're talking yeah. about. So it's. It looks like we all know. did the vinyl I'm... LP though. Yes, Am I that's correct. What... Yeah, that's what I did. I'm finding that annoying. I did the vinyl LP without the Australia and New Zealand releases only. So without Fruit of the Heart. Yeah, because we're not in Australia or New Zealand, so we didn't get Fruit Fruit of the Heart. Heart. I did Fruit of the Heart in Perfect. I I I always listen to whatever the original version of the album was, and that's what I thought the vinyl I tried to as well, but then I looked at this, and I was just like, I'm not going to (laughs) just dissect it. This is the one that's on Spotify. It looks mostly right. I'm going with it. It depends on what your definition of the, the is, Matt, I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the, the. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's wouldn't it be crazy if we keep saying the the and it's actually the the or yeah. the the i don't think so i think it's pretty much the the but like yeah. um the yeah, the. We'll see. yeah so, so. You, yeah you add your own uh affect on different well, say syllables. it say it like you would say so. any other the band like the white stripes the yeah, the, the right yeah. true so. what about that band that's just exclamation points it's like chick, Dada chick, is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it chick chick chick? I think that's or, what they go by. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Stupid. So, like yeah, that is stupid. Must be crazy. I am with you, That's stupid. <laughs> you don't like <laughs> art, that's why. I don't <laughs> like art. I hate art. Yeah, Use words and sounds. Good thing you don't and... do a podcast where you analyze <laughs> a large I know. area of, of visual of a not visual of a I would make the worst stuff. artist. Yeah, you would. But that's a, that's why you're a critic. That's right, an amateur critic at that. I can't make so. art, but I can tell you why yours sucks. Yeah, that's, isn't that what the whole critic field is? Really, that's pretty that's much. Like what, that's basically what Pitchfork is, right? Like right. basically, like I can't really make the art, but I'll just take a really intense except, view of it. Yeah, except I'm, I don't get paid, so. Exactly. We are an amateur podcast. We are. We'll just keep saying that. We need to, John. We need to start logo. getting. We need to start get start getting that ad revenue. The taste of that. Coming in. I, I mean, it's just when you guys are ready to, to read ads for better help mental health, which I don't even know if any of us would actually refer anybody to it, but you know, we'd have to, we'd have to be willing to sell our soul. But so maybe one week we'll do it and surprise people. And yeah, but yeah, we have to get that, that ad revenue potentially at some point, but don't be surprised if one week you're hearing protein bars and boner ads. Are you us. trying to get more vitamins into your diet? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, Josh has a solution for you. <laughs> It's the same six. Every podcast I listen to, regardless of genre, it's the same 10, you know? And some of them, I'm like, "Uh, I don't know if I could advertise that. So anyway, let's let's go back to the... (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) Product placement. Mountain Dew Zero and Taco Bell. When you have a long night gaming because you're depressed. Mountain Dew Zero and Taco Bell. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When, you, when you're young or you hate your body Mountain Snort Dew Adderall and, Taco, yeah. and drink Coke Zero <laughs> There's a shortage of Adderall so. Anyway, we've lost, the, we've lost the whole theme right here the, I, I think the, 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 the soul mining was a really nice discovery this week And I'm glad we listened to it Heck Same, yeah. two thumbs up mm-hmm. 